All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Bresky, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time tuning in with us, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So last month was a crazy start to the school year. 56 live events, thousands of students tuning in uh, from all over. It was a ton of fun. This month, we are continuing on with a theme of space exploration. So we have a crazy amount of events coming up with scientists, with engineers, with astronauts. It's going to be a lot of fun. Head over to exploringbytheseat.com where you can find uh, all kinds of information about the events coming up and to register. So let's get going on today's event. So we're excited to be joined by Dr. Heather McNairn. She is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. She's dedicated her career to creating innovative ways to use satellites to map and monitor Canada's agricultural landscape. So this research is used to create maps of the crops being grown in the country and to assess the conditions of the plants that are growing. And I think Heather's gonna talk a little bit today about a pretty cool uh, system, the RadarSat system, the constellation of satellites that I believe launched in 2019, but Heather can correct me if I am wrong. So let's bring her into the call. Hey, Heather, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Joe? Good, good. And, was, and right? was it 2019? It was 2019. We're going to see a little bit about that launch as well. So Excellent. do you want me to load up my presentation here? Let's do it. We'll get your presentation loaded. I will let you take over. The groups that are starting to join us on YouTube and Facebook, let us know where you're tuning in from. Get your questions ready. Of course, our live classrooms as well will be coming to you for some questions as well. Looks like the presentation is there. Heather, I will let you take over. Okay, thank you very much. And, and welcome everyone to uh, this presentation. I'm really excited to be here uh, today to speak with you. Um, so Joe uh, provided a little bit of uh, introduction uh, to myself, but uh, let me add a little bit of detail to that. Um, as Joe was mentioning, I am a research scientist in the field of remote sensing, and I work for the Government of Canada in uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So uh, you can see here I have a pretty diverse background. I have a Bachelor's of Environmental Studies, a Master's in Soil Science, and a PhD in Geography. So my background is quite varied, and actually this is pretty typical of the field of science of remote sensing, that there it's a very diverse group. So we have uh, individuals who are aerospace engineers, um, individuals with uh, degrees in physics, hydrology, biology, geography. So there's really something for everyone in this uh, area of science. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what remote sensing scientists do. Um, so you can see some photographs on the bottom of my screen here. So if we start from left to right. Um, so admittedly, some of the work that we do is, is not so glamorous. Um, you can see this is a picture of myself. I'm out in the fields of, of uh, Western Canada in the prairies taking measurements of soil. Um, but sometimes we have the opportunity to work with some pretty amazing groups uh, in this field of science. So I've done a number of experiments with NASA, and you can see um, an, a photograph here of myself and some of my team uh, members uh, standing in front of an aircraft that NASA um, flew for us. Uh, sometimes we get to do some pretty, um, uh, see some pretty amazing things. And as Joe mentioned, uh, Canada launched uh, a mission last year, and I was fortunate enough to travel to California to SpaceX to witness the launch of that Canadian satellite. And sometimes you get to meet some pretty amazing people. And so recently I had the opportunity to meet uh, the Canadian astronaut, Jeremy Hansen. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about agriculture in Canada. Um, so we know Canada has a, um, a huge geography and across Canada, there is about 160 million acres of total farmland. So to get our head around a little bit, what that means, um, 160 million acres of farmland is about 2.5 billion tennis courts worth of land. So that's a lot of land um, uh, where we're growing agriculture and, and crops. Uh, if we wanted to work, walk from one coast of Canada to the other coast, and just observe what's happening in the fields along the way, it would take us five years to make that journey. So that's a pretty exhausting journey. So is monitoring agriculture an impossible task? Uh, well, certainly not if we take uh, the vantage point of 800 kilometers above the earth. 
So this is a picture I really like. Uh, this was taken in 1969, and it's a view from the Apollo 11 spacecraft, and it shows the Earth rising above the moon's horizon. And it reminds us in scientists that in science that sometimes we need to take a different perspective and we need to challenge ourselves to see the world differently. And that's really what space allows us to do. It allows us to look at earth and in particular agriculture in a way um, unlike any other. Satellites are pretty amazing. They orbit the earth at incredible speeds, 17,000 miles per hour and they orbit the Earth many times in any given day. Um, but satellites are pretty simple. What they do when they're coming over the Earth is they are measuring the amount of energy that the Earth would naturally emit or the amount of energy that the Earth reflects. So if we think about the sun um, sending um, uh, radiation or sending sunlight, down to the earth, that energy that hits the earth gets scattered. And satellites are simply measuring the amount of energy, uh, the amount of sunlight that is scattered or that is emitted, energy emitted by the earth. And so our job as remote sensing scientists is to try to figure out what is it that these satellites are telling us. They're, bring, they're providing us with uh, data in terms of energy, but we need to understand what that energy is telling us about our soils and about the condition of our crops. So how do satellites see the Earth? Um, well, some satellites are simply more sophisticated versions of the camera on your cell phone. So indeed, they're much more sophisticated. They're certainly much more expensive and they're much, much farther away from the Earth. Um, but like your camera, uh, satellites see the amount of energy in blue, green and red wavelengths that is scattered by the Earth. So you see an um, image uh, at the bottom. This is a just a snapshot of an image I took from Google Earth. So Google Earth takes satellite images and displays them for us. And this is actually an image of Ottawa. It's the central experimental farm where I work in Ottawa. Um, and it's it, it shows us that satellites see the Earth in those red, green, and, and blue wavelengths that your camera sees, but at a much different perspective from much further away. Um, but other satellites um, are quite different than your cell phone camera. So other satellites have what I call X-ray vision. And that means that these satellites can see right through clouds. So I'm stationed in Ottawa and today it's a very cloudy and overcast day. So if a satellite is coming over Ottawa today, it won't be able to see the earth uh, because of the clouds. So these special uh, radar satellites, we call them, have this X-ray vision and they can see right through clouds. These radar satellites are also really special because they can operate even in the dark. And that's important when we think about Canada's north um, because that part of Canada can be shrouded in darkness for long periods of the year. But even though it's dark uh, for long periods of the, the year, we wanna be able to see the the condition of our oceans, we want to be able to map ice that's in the Arctic and to map the Arctic landscape. So we need satellites that can see even in the dark. So these special radar satellites can see through clouds and can even see in the dark. Um, so Joe mentioned in our introduction that uh, Canada um, has um, a special constellation mission that they launched recently. Um, this actually isn't Canada's first satellite mission. This is actually our third mission. So we have launched satellites previously, but this is a brand new one for us. And this radar constellation mission is using that special technology, those special X-rays to see through clouds and see in the darkness. And it takes a team of engineers and scientists to design, to build, to launch and operate uh, satellite missions. Um, so Canadian engineers and remote sensing scientists worked together for about 15 years in order to design, build, launch, and now operate these newest satellites. Um, so the role of the remote sensing scientist um, is to help the engineers understand what those satellites need to measure. Um, so we do a lot of research, a lot of science, and that helps the en engineers understand how to build these satellites. Um, so as I mentioned, this newest uh, Canadian mission has three satellites. Um, 
uh, in the constellation. And this is a photograph of one of those three satellites. So this is myself and some of my, um, my colleagues. Uh, and this is a lab in Montreal. And this satellite is all packed up right now. Uh, but it's in the lab and uh, for final testing that the engineers are doing some testing to make sure everything on that satellite is working properly. Uh, then when those tests were done, this one satellite and its two companion satellites were shipped to California to SpaceX. Um, and they were the three of them were loaded up into what's called a rocket fairing. Um, so the satellites are here and this rocket fairing sits on top of a Falcon 9 rocket. And then, as Joe had mentioned, in June, uh, actually on the 12th of June of 2019, SpaceX successfully launched the, these three satellites into space for Canada. Uh, so this one photo uh, here, uh, you can see the rocket in the background. So the rocket is, it is, is at the bottom and the three satellites sit on top of the rocket. Uh, what SpaceX uh, did is they launched this rocket, they deployed Canada's three satellites into space, um, and then the bottom part of this rocket um, came back to Earth and landed um, right about where I am crouched down in this landing pad. Um, so now that the satellites are in space and they're orbiting the Earth or collecting data, um, you know, what's the job of the remote sensing scientists now? Um, so we have to figure out what to do with these images. What are they telling us about crops and what are they telling us about soils? Uh, so we do that by conducting research experiments. Um, and in a really important part of a research experiment is to go into the field and take measurements. So here are some photographs of some of the field crews out collecting measurements. So at the top, we're collecting um, some measurements of the amount of water in the soil. And we also collect information about the crops, what crop type is being grown, how much biomass the crop has, what growth stage the crop is in, and other measurements to tell us how productive or healthy the crops are. So while these crews are in the field, the remote sensing um, satellites and, and aircraft are doing their job. Um, so we're collecting imagery from satellites but we also fly aircraft. This is a NASA aircraft that has flown for us for some of our experiments. And sometimes we need to take measurements really close up uh, to the Earth. So this is a, um, a remote sensing sensor that's put in the field to collect very um, close up and, and precise measurements of energy. So we have field crews in the, in the field collecting measurements. We have satellite data being collected, and now it's the job of the remote sensing scientists to figure out what these remote sensing and satellite um, platforms are telling us. So the remote sensing scientists, um, they're going to create computer algorithms or computer models that relate what the satellite is telling us to what we see um, on the Earth. So we're going to take a, a, a walk through uh, to see what some of these um, uh, some of these computer algorithms can tell us. So one of the um, one of the first things that I did when I joined Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the first research project that I led, um, I was asked to develop a method or a computer model that would take satellite data and identify um, what crop is being grown in the field. Uh, so we did exactly what I had just mentioned. Uh, we collected observations in the field, we collected data from satellites, and then we created computer models uh, where we could use the satellite data to identify what crop is being grown. Um, so once the science was completed, the methodology was given to another group in my department, and that, that team now uses satellite data to map what crop is grown in every field across Canada. And remember what we talked about earlier, that means 2.5 billion tennis courts worth of land that has to be mapped from satellites. Um, these maps are produced now every single year um, from coast to coast, and they're provided free of charge on the internet and anyone can download them. So I've taken an example of one of these maps at the bottom. So the gray areas are non-agriculture areas, so crops aren't growing uh, in these northern areas of Canada. But you can see that with the satellite data and the science method that we developed, 
This team is now mapping um, all of the agricultural area of Canada, and you can see all of the detail in terms of what crops are being grown that are, that are identified in this map. And on the left, I've just taken a, uh, a zoom um, of an area. This is Winnipeg, Manitoba. And you can see that the satellites are able to identify each and every field um, in that area of Manitoba. So these maps help us understand how agriculture is changing across Canada. They help us model how farmland is interacting with its environment, and they're even used to help improve weather forecasting. Um, so now that we have satellites mapping crops across Canada, we can now use space to help us answer how crops are changing across Canada. So we know that the climate is changing and we expect because of climate change that there will be shifts in where and how crops are grown in Canada. So this is an animation. It's an area of Manitoba, Canada. Um, and what we're looking at here is where soybeans are being grown in Manitoba. So soybeans are a really important crop for Canada and they are a long season heat loving crop. And in this part of Canada, um, we're seeing fewer early killing fall frosts, and that's encouraging farmers to plant more soybeans. So this animation, all derived, created from satellites, is stepping us through from 2009 to 2015, where soybeans are growing. And you can see an explosion of how many acres of soybeans are growing, and we can see soybeans being grown in areas that they hadn't been growing before. Um, another really interesting example I wanted to show you was um, an example from Costa Rica. So I'm working with a PhD student uh, from a banana um, corporation called Corbana. Uh, what Corbana wants to know is, can they use satellite data to monitor banana production in Costa Rica? So um, we're lucky to see some of those images from that new Canadian satellite. Um, and that's this image on the left. So this is the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. The black area in this image is the Caribbean. Um, and we see mangrove swamps along the Caribbean coast. So if we think about banana uh, plants, and I've included some pictures here, banana plants have these ginormous leaves on them. And these big, big leaves create a lot of scattering of energy. And the radar satellite can see that. And these really bright patches of land on this satellite image are where bananas are being grown. So the satellite is really uh, can really easily identify where the banana plantations are. And we could even calculate the acreage of bananas that are being grown. But what's really interesting that this PhD student is looking at is he is collecting um, multiple images over this area, this Caribbean region of Costa Rica. And as we collect radar images, um, he is able to identify from one image to the next, how much those banana plants are growing. So centimeter by centimeter, measuring the growth, the change in height of those banana plants. And that's important because the height of those banana plants um, tell us how productive that, that plant will be. Um, I want to come back to Canada and talk about how we can use satellites to watch canola grow. So canola is another really important crop for Canada. And what we are doing in this project with Canadian industry is to use um, the Canadian radar satellites to tell us when a canola field is flowering. And the reason we want to know if the canola crop is flowering is because it's at that point in the canola's growth that diseases can happen. Uh, so this is a research site um, in Manitoba, and there are four canola fields. You can see them highlighted here. These are our test fields um, that we're doing, that we're using for this experiment. So as the satellite comes over, so this a sat, the satellite came over on June the 15th, um, because of the amount of energy that the satellite is measuring, um, we can tell that 
this particular field, for example, we're going to use this one as an example, that this particular field, that the canola in that field is now de developing leaves and some of the buds on the canola plant are starting to develop as well. Then on July the 4th, the satellite comes over this test site again. And now the amount of energy that the satellite is measuring is telling us that this canola field is now starting to flower. So that's a really important growth stage for us to know. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the satellite comes over again, and now it tells us that, that that particular canola field is starting to develop pods. So pods, you see a picture of it here. Um, this is where the seeds of the canola, um, uh, where the seeds uh, start to develop. And then on August the 9th, the satellite tells us that this canola field is now mature and is ready to be harvested. So we've talked a little bit about crops, um, identifying crop type and growth stage and even the productivity of the crops. But we can use satellites to tell us something about soils as well. And that can be really, really important. And one thing we want to know about the soils is how much water is in the soil. And that's because when soils are really, really wet, um, they can lead to a lot of problems. Um, so for example, they can lead to flooding. And the top photograph here, this is a soybean field slide. This is a canola plant. So the canola is flowering. And we see that there's disease that has started to happen in this canola plant. And when the soils are really wet, sometimes farmers are, are unable to get their tractors onto the field to even seed their field. So that's that's a really big problem. Um, so just like before, um, we can collect field data, we can collect satellite data and create a model or an algorithm um, that helps us map how wet soils are. Um, so this is an example, the bottom map here. Uh, this is also from the Canadian um, uh, radar sat satellite. And this is, a, this is of a test site in Manitoba. Um, so we've color coded this map. So uh, the fields that are red and yellow, those fields are really, really dry. And fields that are mapped in blue, uh, those fields have higher amounts of, of moisture in the soil. So we have created this, this algorithm uh, to use the satellite data to map how much water is in the soil. So in order to uh, help us understand how important that information could be and how it can help farmers make decisions, we're going to, we're going to go down to uh, South America, to Chile, and uh, use this as an example of how important that information can be. Uh, so Chile is a heavily irrigated country, and with climate change, that means that that country has to be very careful about how, it's, how it uses its water resources. So they want to irrigate um, the crops when the crops need it, when the crops are thirsty, uh, but they don't want to use so much water to be wasteful. Uh, so chicory is a really important crop for Chile. And I have a picture of some chicory seedlings on the left. And you see these chicory seedlings are very, very small and they're very delicate. They live for about 40 days in just the very top part of the soil. So if the soil is really dry, those chicory seedlings get very thirsty um, and they can die if they don't get enough water. Um, so what we did here is we used the same data, the same satellite and the same method that I showed you over Manitoba, but now we're applying it um, to Chile. So the bottom three images, we've color coded them again. So these are three images from Chile and the black outline outlines a uh, chicory field that we're trying to monitor. So again, the, the orange and red, that tells us that the soil is really dry. So on October the 20th, the Canadian radar sat satellite came over this site and it told us that the soils are really dry. And then about three days later on October 23rd, the satellite came over again and we can now see that part of that field is much wetter. So what happened in that field in those three days between one satellite pass and another? Well, the farmer has irrigated that field. And in Chile, they use these big pivot irrigation systems. You see them here um, in order to, to irrigate the field. And then about a week later, the satellite came over again. And the satellite is now telling us that yes, part of that, 
part of the field that was irrigated is still wet, but part of the field is starting to dry. And that tells the farmer that um, soon he's going to have to irrigate this field again. And I wanna give you one last example um, to show you how we can bring, bring all of these pieces together to help farmers assess risk for their, um, their agricultural production. So in the very center here, um, this is a web application that I'm working with Canadian industry to develop. And the application is called DIRT. You see it here, Disease Risk Tool DIRT. Um, and the purpose of this web tool is to bring together all of this information to help farmers understand whether their fields are at risk that disease could develop in their field. So on the left here, we use data from all kinds of different satellites. I've talked a lot about the Canadian radar sat satellites and our new RCM satellite, but we use satellites from, from the US, satellites from Europe um, and many other nations as well. We take all of that satellite data, we apply our computer algorithms and we create these layers of information on how wet the soil is, what's being grown in, in the, uh, what crop is being grown in the field. And at the bottom here are things like whether or not a plant is flowering or is in a specific growth stage. All of those layers of information are brought into this web tool. And when it's finally uh, developed and put on the internet, it will allow farmers to query, to investigate uh, what the status of their fields, uh, what the status of their fields are and give them information as to whether or not they should go and investigate if disease has actually um, taken foothold in their fields. So I wanna finish with one last slide, and this is probably the most important slide of my presentation. And I have a really important question to pose to each and every one of you. And that is, is there a scientist in you? So I've listed here some of the characteristics of a scientist. So you can ask yourself these questions. So scientists are um, curious by nature and some might say that we're pretty nosy. Scientists are, are also very passionate about what they do and they need to be creative, innovative and persistent. So sometimes we formulate hypotheses, we test our hypothesis and we find out that our hypothesis was wrong. And so we have to go back, roll up our sleeves and start over again, come up with a new hypothesis, collect more data. So you have to be creative and persistent in science. Um, and scientists generally have a desire to understand the world around them. And in my opinion, I think some of the best scientists um, are, are the most courageous people. So I'm a little bit farther along in my career, um, but I still need inspiration and I take inspiration from those who have come before me. So there is a, a famous um, scientist, Robert Goddard. He was a physicist and rocket engineer. And he had, has this saying that I've carried with me for about 25 years now. And I think about this um, often. And what Dr. Goddard said was, it is, it, it is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And that means in science, we should never limit ourselves and we should never think that, that anything is impossible. So I tell my research team um, that dreaming costs you nothing. So if you go down the path of being a scientist, you know, don't limit yourself. Remember what I said, look at the world in a different way and it will cost you nothing to think big and to dream. I wanted to give a shout out just at the very end. We have a couple of um, Twitter accounts. Um, if you're interested in following some of the really incredible research that's going on, we have a, um, a Twitter account, Sisters of SAR, and we have another one, Ladies of Landsat. And we post on there the incredible, some of the incredible research that is happening from all around the world. And I'd like to finish by saying that I hope that each and every every one of you consider a res uh, career in science. Thank you very much. Back to you, Joe. All right, All right. back in now, Heather, I can take that screen share down. Uh, thank you, that was an awesome presentation. I love the way that you wrapped it up. There's like so much to unpack there. I think when most people think about space, they're thinking about astronauts and technology and things like that, but taking that lens and turning it back on the earth and using it for purposes like agriculture it's pretty amazing. I mean, two and a half billion tennis fields 
uh, of, of, of crops. I mean, you, you could never cover all of that on foot uh, or by plane or, but these three satellites, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. So how did you feel, Heather, standing just before launch? I mean, you must've been a little bit nervous. Sometimes I think we all know satellites <laughs> sometimes don't always launch the way uh, it's planned. You must've been a little bit nervous. I, I, I was a bit nervous. It was, you know, I spent about half my career um, working in the science leading up to that mission. And, and I know that there were hundreds, if not thousands of other Canadians that, that had worked on that. I know the engineers do a bang up job. They're very meticulous. They're, they're so good at what they do. Um, but when you see these things put together, you start thinking about all of the things that, you know, that, that could go wrong. Um, so you are a little bit nervous, but I have to say we were so proud. There was a team um, team of us from Canada there, um, and we were just just thrilled to see to see that uh, that happen. Um, so I think more than being nervous, I was just really proud of Canada. All right, excellent. Well, to those tuning in via YouTube right now, uh, now is your chance to start sending in some questions via the chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. And we'll snag some of those. I wanted to give a couple shout outs. I can see we've got some three, four, grade three, fours joining us in Fortune Bay Academy in Newfoundland. We've got Ms. Green joining us in Ottawa. We even have Akash. Akash is joining us in India. So he's staying up a little bit late to catch this presentation today. Very cool. So let's get meeting a couple live classrooms and let's get some questions. So I'm gonna bring in Mr. Matthew's class first to the call. They're joining us in London, Ontario. How are we doing London? Say hi, everybody. Um, there they are. All right, who's got a question for Heather? We're a very quiet group, so I, I anticipated <laughs> and I wrote some down ourselves. Um, we're studying in, as a grade eight class, water systems in Canada. And one question that I have is, are these satellites being used in other ways, um, monitoring polar ice caps and glacier growth and decline? Are they being used in other ways? Uh, that's a great question. And the answer is absolutely. Um, it's, it's really hard to capture all of the different things that uh, these satellites are used for. The, those, those radar satellites were actually one of the, the very first um, big users of, of, of radar sat was the Canadian Ice Service. Um, and they were interested in using uh, satellite data to track um, uh, ice uh, and and to allow ships to better navigate uh, through the uh, uh, through the Arctic. Um, so they're used for ice mapping. Um, they're used to track ocean features. Uh, they track oil spills. They track um, changes in permafrost. They track ships at sea. Um, we're using them to map Canadian forests. Um, changes in, in lakes, uh, in terms of uh, heights of, of lakes, uh, wetlands mapping. Um, so there, there's just a, a, a very, very long list um, and that the satellites are used very extensively within Canada. All right, Ms. Pat's class is joining us, but they had to duck out before the Q&A started, but they did leave us a question and they're curious about the lifespan uh, of this constellation of satellites? How long do we hope or expect it to be giving us these great results? Yeah, so these satellites are typically um, designed engine from an engineering perspective for five to seven years. So that tends to be the life, the engineering lifespan of these satellites, but they have a lot of redundancy in the satellite. So they have backup systems um, and, and other redundancies. Um, and so the first Canadian satellite, RadarSat-1, for example, um, even though it was designed for, um, I can't remember if it was five or seven years, but it ended up lasting 16 years. So it's, it's very common for these satellites to last much longer past the engineering design. Um, so they will keep operating until there's a, a critical fail failure in the system. But um, our experience in Canada, some great engineering and technology um, uh, from our Canadian scientists and engineers, and, and they tend to outlive their expected uh, lifespan. All right, well, we will definitely be rooting for that. Uh, let's bring another classroom in live here with us. Uh, we'll get them to unmute the mic for us and we will introduce, uh, there they are. 
Mr. Eager they're joining us in Norwich, Ontario. They're pretty excited. There they are. How are we doing, boys and girls? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I see some questions in the chat, so let's get some of them live. Go ahead. Yeah, Sam, do you want to ask your question? Okay. Um, how do you, guys, how do you like physically see a crop sickness? So, I, were you able to hear that? Okay, I think I heard that. That, yeah, how do you physically see a crop signature? Yeah. Sickness. Yeah. Oh, about about if it, if a crop is diseased. Yeah. 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 So when um so when crops are diseased, a few things happen. So um sometimes some of the pigmentation in the crop changes. Um so if you watch like in your house plants, for example, when they get stressed. Um, the color in the leaves changes. So sometimes it changes from green to sort of a yellowish color and then ultimately a brown color. So that's the pigments in, in the leaves of the crops that are, or the leaves of the plants that are changing. And satellites see that just like your eyes see it. Um, so it's gonna change the amount of energy that that plant is going to scatter. So it will scatter energy differently and the satellite is going to see that, that change of energy because those pigments are changing. And with those special class of, of satellites, radars that I call them, um, sometimes when crops get get stressed, they also change in their structure. So if you think again about, about house plants, if you don't water them for a while, they get very wilty and the, the leaves droop on them. Um, and the radars can see that change in the structure. So um, there's many different things that satellites are looking for, changes in the pigmentation and changes in the structure. And that changes how much energy is get gets is, is scattered. All right, it's pretty amazing. Uh, let's see. Let's grab something from YouTube here. So, uh, Miss Warren's group is joining us in Newfoundland, and I'm gonna put a couple questions your way here, Heather. The first one is from Mateo. And Mateo is wondering, with the satellites up there now, do you have a number of farms that there are in Canada? And then Grayson wants to know, if you weren't a scientist, what do you think you'd be doing? <laughs> um, I should know what the number of, of farms are in Canada. And I apologize, I don't know that what that number is off the top of my head. But what I will say is that um, Statistics Canada collects data on the number of farms that are grown um, across Canada. Um, and we're now using some of the maps that I showed you that are produced from coast to coast in Canada to help um, to help augment our knowledge of of, of how many um, uh, how much uh, agricultural land is in production. So those satellite data are helping Statistics Canada and our understanding of um, of uh, the acreages that are growing. And as you saw in my animation, it's not just about how many acres are growing, but uh, we see that crops are being grown in places that they um, that they haven't been before. Um, the second question was, if I wasn't a scientist, uh, what would I be? And <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I, I'm not really sure. I, I I'm pretty sure that that you know because of my some some of the passion I have about the environment, I would have always been in a field of of environmental studies. So, um, and 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 most likely in, in science. I'm just a very curious person. Um, I care a lot about the environment, um, and I think um, my pathway to being a scientist was not very straightforward. I didn't think about that when I was in elementary school or high school, um, I sort of followed my nose and I ended up being a scientist. And sometimes you know that you wanna be a scientist and sometimes you're not, you know, the path is not so straightforward for you. And I think whichever way you get to science, it doesn't really matter. Um, I got here in a very roundabout way, but um, it's a terrific field to be in. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point is, you know, there isn't one way or one path or one story to become a scientist. There's all kinds of paths that people take and they twist and they turn. And um, yeah, very cool. So let's check in with Mr. Matthews group again, see if they have a follow up question. Hey, London. Yeah, we have someone he's making his way over. Excellent. I 
I'm just wondering how long did it take to make this project? Um, so I showed a lot of different projects in my presentation. And so the time varied a lot. So the project where we created the method to map crops across Canada, it would, it took us about three to five years for that project. Some projects take longer because the problems are more difficult. Um, but typically our projects last for many years. We have to collect all that field in the data. Or in, we have to collect all that data in the field. We have to collect all that satellite data, make the computer models. Um, and science is very incremental. So you make, um, usually you make, I think about it as putting a drop in the ocean. So every project we do, uh, it's like a drop in the ocean. And next thing you know, you have a, you know, you have an ocean of knowledge. So scientists is, science is very incremental. Absolutely. And I think, you know, maybe the cool, but maybe to some people frustrating thing about science is that you can go out with 10 questions and come back with 100 more. And I think that's <laughs> just, uh, the nature of science is we find something out, but that leads to more questions that we have to dive deeper into. Yeah. All right. Let's bring our group in Norwich back. Do you guys have another question for us? Hi, so we're just wondering if it takes 15 years for the satellite process to take place until the launch. How do you keep up with um, advancements or changes in technology to make sure that as you're sending that satellite up, it's got the most recent tech? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there are points in the development of a satellite where new technologies, you know, can be introduced if there are small changes um, in, in those satellites. Um, but, um, and, and there are just so many technologies, so many advance, advancements that are occurring. Um, and so typically before, you know, before one satellite mission is launched, we're already planning the next satellite mission and the next satellite mission, it will have um, a lot of new innovations and a lot of new technology on it. Um, but even once the hardware is all put together, those satellites are built and tested and launched um, because these are digital technologies, uh, even though they're orbiting the earth uh, far away from us. Um, there's still an opportunity to um, create new innovative ways to use this digital technology. So the engineering and engineering and science scientists can create you know, new algorithms, um, new sort of digital ways of programming the satellite to create um, ways of imaging the earth that weren't possible. So it's not always about the hardware. Um, sometimes it's about the digital processing and, and, and the algorithm part of it. Um, but it's a very, very fast moving um, area of, of research and engineering. And there are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of satellites that are orbiting the earth. Um, and so it, it, it takes a lot to keep up in terms of this technology. All right, I'm gonna bring a couple questions from YouTube here. So if um, our classes in Norwich or London have another question, just shoot me a message in the comments and I'll, uh, I'll come back to you. But I do wanna grab a couple more YouTube questions. So Akash is wondering, you talked about kind of that X-ray vision that can see through the clouds. What does what's happening under the clouds have an impact? Like say it's a thunderstorm or heavy rain, um, maybe something, does that have an impact? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And so um, so each satellite uh, technology images in, in these different wavelengths. So I talked about red, green, and blue wavelengths, um, but there's a whole spectrum of wavelengths. So those X-ray radar satellites I talked about, they collect data in wavelengths that are really long, sort of the length of your hand. You can think about the wavelengths being that long. Um, and so those wavelengths are able to look right through clouds um, because the water droplets in the clouds are pretty small. But if we have thunderstorms or we have rain that is occurring in large rain droplets, then even those special satellites, um, those rain droplets will, will, will scatter and, and, the, and that will affect the radar return. So if we have big thunderstorms with lots of rain um, occurring, the radar still see the see the Earth, but the you know the energy or the data that the satellite is 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 collecting is sort of distorted by those thunderstorms, those big rainstorms. So we think about those special satellites as being able to see through clouds, 
um, but they're still impacted by big water droplets like rain. All right. Mr. Matthews is letting me know they have another question, so I'm going to bring them in. How difficult is it for you to build satellites? Um, well, pretty difficult, actually. And so it takes, you know, it takes a big team. I, I'm not an aerospace engineer myself, um, but having sat um, with that sort of that uh, those group of specialists uh, many times, um, these are pretty complicated um, instruments. And they're made of much. They're made of a bunch of different pieces. So we have solar panels. We have antenna on them. We have the electronics. Um, we need people to know how to protect the satellite from radiation, for example. So it takes a team of of engineers, and and these engineers have have a lot of experience in very specific things, like how to build a solar panel, or how to build an antenna. Um, and so those teams of 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 engineers work on their individual pieces. And then when those pieces are designed and tested, they integrate, they put all of those pieces of the satellite together and then they do further testing. Um, so it's a pretty complicated um, procedure to make sure that all of the pieces are working, they're integrated, they work together. Um, but as you can see from, uh, from what we talked about from Canada, we have some pretty exceptional engineering expertise in Canada. Um, and they've done an exceptional job of, of launching um, three missions for Canada, and they've all been highly successful. All right. So we have one more question here coming in via YouTube that I want to work in. Um, ah, there it is. So uh, Heather is wondering about the orbiting. How high are the is the satellite system orbiting? Yeah, so it depends on the satellite itself. Um, so the Canadian, those that the Radarsat Constellation mission I talked about, um, it's at, at 800 um, kilometers above the Earth. But every satellite is different. Some are a little bit lower than that. Some are going to be higher than that. Um, but they're all in that range. Hundreds, you can think of them as hundreds of kilometers above the Earth. So it's pretty amazing that they can see the, the Earth the way that they do in that kind of detail. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to start off with a shout out to the classrooms tuning in via YouTube today. Thank you for sending in all of the great questions. A shout out to our camera classrooms. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you for your questions. Um, and of course, Heather, thank you for being our first uh, event with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. That was definitely a perspective that I think a lot of students might not have thought about when they think about Space Week. But it's amazing, you know, 800 kilometers up, how much data that we can gather um, about our country. And I'd like to say thanks to you, Joe, for inviting me to do this. And um, thank you to all the students that joined and, you know, best of luck and go signs go. Excellent. Well, uh, to those still tuning in, exploringbytheseat.com. We have a lot more events coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, so we hope to see your classrooms again. Heather, again, thank you so much. And we are going to sign off for today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>